really glad that you all are here. Um, everything that we do today will be made available on the NCSSM Distance um, Education website. So we'll have the PowerPoint, we'll have um, the student handout and the teacher handout, and we'll also have the um, archived version of the webinar. So the only thing that um, you might have to bear with me today is that I don't have the emulator, the calculator emulator working on my computer, as some of you heard. So we might have to pick up the camera that's on me and actually put it over the calculator because I didn't know that until I got here this morning. So we don't have um, our webcam or anything. Uh, I mean, I'm not our webcam, but our document camera. But um, I'll kind of work on Excel, and then you guys can either play along with me on Excel or you can hopefully use your calculators. And if you have questions, please, please feel free to just ch ch type in the chat window or you can raise your hand. Um, you can send the question just to Carol or me, or you can send it to everybody. It, it's fine with me if you send it to everybody. That way, everybody can see the question. And um, if there, you know, if there's any issue like you can't hear us at any given time, just let us know. Yeah, please, please do um, let us know about the audio uh, because we can't tell from here if you're having any problems. So um, let us do chat. Okay, so let's get started. Um, today's topic is nonlinear data analysis. The last webinar was about linear data analysis, um, and I think people have a lot of experience with uh, linear data analysis using things like linear regression. We talked some about the criterion for um, the least squares line or the linear regressions line. We also talked a little bit about residuals. So I'll be assuming some of that knowledge, but we'll work through um, calculating residuals today too. And also, if you um, if you have particular uh, suggestions in terms of how you're thinking about using these types of um, problems or topics with your students, or if you um, do professional de development for teachers and you have ideas of, um, that you want to share, please feel free to just chime on in there. We're always happy to hear your suggestions. So what I'd like to do today is um, the goals for the session are just to work through uh, mathematics uh, in terms of a real-world data analysis problem, we'll probably definitely get through one problem and we might be able to have a chance to talk about uh, an extended problem. And to think about, um, as we try to find nonlinear models for a given data set, how, would, how do we assess our models and then use those models to make predictions? We'd also like to discuss um, how we can implement the Common Core State Standards mathematical practices through these real-world tasks and to um, share some web resources with you related to nonlinear data analysis. There's some really nice resources out there that uh, you may or may have not seen, and I'd like to talk about some of those. So as we work through the task, uh, again, I want you to kind of put on your student hat. Think about uh, that you can even picture them, the students in your classroom, and how they might approach the problem. And of course, we have um, lots of different kinds of learners in our classroom, so we might have different approaches and then also to anticipate their responses and their questions and to consider how we can use the students' ideas to contribute to building the idea of the mathematical concepts. So here's our first example. Um, we have this data that has to do with um, predicting how fast a car was going when they measured the skid length on the road. So it says, when police investigate the scene of an automobile accident, they look for skid marks and use the length of those marks to estimate the speed at, uh, at which the car was traveling. That's a typo there, sorry. Um, the results of experiments with a um, test car are shown below. And then what we want to do is think about this data. Sorry about the typos there. Um, we have skid lengths here in the left-hand column. Can you all see my mouse? Yeah. And then over here, you have the estimated speed. So on the next slide, the questions that we want to uh, consider are which of these variables are the independent variable and um, which or is the independent variable and which one is the dependent variable? And to have students think about this idea of dependence, independence, um, and explain their answers. And then the next question is to um, ask them to use a linear function of some sort, either their knowledge of linear functions or linear regression, if they know about that, to create a linear model for the data. So do you guys um, want to answer my first question? That is, 
which of these variables should be the independent variable and which, which should be the dependent variable. Please feel free to answer. It helps me a lot since I can't see your faces if I get some response from my participants. So you can just type it in the chat window. Which one do you think is the independent variable? So, um, independent yeah. variable in the speed is the speed. Do you see that? Oh, yeah, it just took a minute. So thank you, Lisa. It says the car speed is the independent variable. Because the, because the skid mark, are you thinking that the skid mark depends on how fast the car was going? Is that what you were thinking about, Lisa? Yes, okay. So in that case, this is kind of interesting because it is true that the length of the skid mark is dependent on how fast the car was traveling. But if you think about this particular data set and how the police might use it, they're actually measuring the skid length and then based on these this previous data, um, trying to think about, well, if we do, we're just investigating this accident and we're trying to estimate how fast the driver was driving, then what we have to go on is the information from the skid length. So I think this is kind of interesting because of that. You're right that the skid length depends on how fast the um, driver was going, but if you're the police person, yeah, the perspective matters exactly. If you're the police person and you're measuring the skid length, then what you're trying to do is assess how fast the driver was going. So I, I put that in there kind of at the last minute. Originally, I was just going to say use the skid mark as an independent variable, but I think it's interesting to, to think of it in terms of that perspective. So for our case, if we really were the, the police person and we're trying to think about how fast this driver was going, we might use the skid mark as an independent variable and then try to come up with a linear function um, that will fit this data. So again, I've just pushed the linear function. I didn't say look at a scatter plot and determine it. I'm pushing the linear function to begin with. So because I don't have the emulator, um, I'm going to escape and go to a, a, out of the PowerPoint and go to Excel. But you guys can certainly play along with um, on your calculators, and you have the instructions. Um, if you have the handout that Carol sent you, you could pull that up. It's a Word document or a PDF file. Sorry. And then um, if not, if you get stuck on the calculator, you can just let me know and I'll try to go back and uh, let you know where, where I can help you. But for right now, what I did was I just opened up an Excel file. I have skid mark here, speed here, and I've entered in some of the data. So 5, 17, 37, 65, 105. I'll wait for you guys to put that either in your calculator or an Excel spreadsheet. 205, 265. The skid mark is measured in feet and the car speed is measured in miles per hour. And they just, these just go up by 10. Okay, so I'm going to add um, a graph. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to highlight, I'm, I'm clicking on the top of this column and then I'm holding down my mouse and then scrolling over to the right and then I'll let go. And I'll use insert and then I'll find scatter. So there's a scatter plot of the data, and I think if we looked at that data before I read the next question, we might say uh, it doesn't look linear. But I want to go ahead and think about a linear model because I want to talk a little bit about residuals. So um, with this given data set, if you ask the student to come up with a line that represents the data, they might choose a couple of representative points here um, and try to find the equation of the line using what they know about um, linear functions. They could also think about um, trying to kind of come up with a line that would be in the middle of this data and use that as um, a reference point and then, for example, play with a slope. So, so one of the things that a, a participant suggested last time when we did the linear webinar, linear data webinar, was that some of his students might use the approximate intercept here, the y-intercept, to start with, guess at the intercept, and then take two points and come up with a slope and then just tweak those two values. So I don't want to spend too much time on kind of different ways to come up with linear models. There are lots of different ways to come up with linear models. Um, and so I, I just kind of want to keep moving so that we can talk about the, the non-linearity of this data set. On your calculator course, you can hit the stat button 
and then arrow over to Calc, and then choose Linear Regression. And if you've typed this data in L1 and L2, then the default when you push that Linear Regression button is to use the data in L1 and L2. But if um, you've typed it somewhere else, you can actually type in um, linear regression and then type where, wherever you stored the list, like L3, L5, for example. So if you want to, you can go ahead and do a linear regression on your calculator. And I will do it here on Excel by, I think I can double click on this. Nope. Double click on the graph. Let me click off on it. I think I just right click. Nope, can't find it. Add a trend line there. So I right clicked on the data set and I want to add a trend line. And then a dialog box comes up. I want a linear model. The default is linear. I can say I would like to display the equation on the chart down here at the bottom. I'll click that. I believe that's all I need to do, and say close, and there you go. So I have this linear model here on top of the data set. So if I go back to the PowerPoint, then what I want to do is create, we created the scatter plot. We're going to ask the question, how good is our fit? And would you feel confident using your model to make predictions? So you probably have a little bit nicer view on your calculator because you probably have the whole line in there. I've just, uh, it's just um, limited to that particular data set. But if you think about it with your students, what, what might your students say at this point? How good is their fit? And would they feel confident using their model to make predictions? So this idea of making predictions ties back to the idea of which was the independent variable, right? So we decided that the skid length was the independent variable because that's what we're going to measure as a, um, a police officer. And so if you think about it, if you're going to try to make predictions, you might say to the kids, be more specific like, um, well, what if I found, you know, a skid mark of something that's outside of the data set, like 280 feet long? How could, would you feel confident and using your linear model to make a prediction about how fast the cart was going. So do you guys have suggestions about things that your students might say here in terms of assessing the goodness of fit? You can just type in the chat window if you like. What might your students use to think about discussing this idea of feeling confident? Oh, so Lisa asked the question about R. So when she said, would you go look at the R value, which is the R value measures um, how close the data is to uh, how spread the data is, right, in terms of how far it's spread out if the data is linear. So when you think about the R value, what R value did you get? What R value did you get, Lisa? Did you have your diagnostics turned on when you did your linear regression? That R value is called correlation coefficient, right? Oh, okay, so she's not playing along, she just said. So she suspects that it's high. 
and the students would think that that is good. Okay, so again, I didn't do it with my calculator. Did anybody else do it playing along with my calculator? Have diagnostic? So, uh, so Sonia had a .97. Oh, Johnson interesting. County had .975. Okay, so so just like you said, Lisa, the R value is high because when you're looking at the R value. That it measures that closeness of the data to the line. So thank you, Sonia, for giving us that. Because what you're thinking about is if the data is a linear data set, if the data are linear, it's measuring that spread about that line. The problem with R here is that the data is not linear. So I'm so glad you brought that up because I don't think of using R very much because I have other ways to think about whether or not my model is a good fit because we do a lot of data analysis here. So this would be a good example for our students to not rely too much on that R value because if the data is not linear, R doesn't give you information about the data. It gives you that idea of spread. So if I had more data, you might see that the R value would go down because the spread would be wider about that line. So if we go back to our Excel file, what I'd like to do is think about, well, let's just let's advance in the PowerPoint here, because what I'd like to do is think about calculating residuals, which is a, a topic we talked about last time, but we can step through it again, because the residuals will give us, will tell a story about whether or not a model is an appropriate function, the type of function is a reasonable um, model to use for a particular data set. And we talked last time about residuals being the error, a measure of error. So the official definition is the actual data value, the actual y value of the data minus the predicted value. So when we think about predictions, because that's what we were thinking about doing, predict, predicted values will come from using whatever model you have and evaluating that model at the independent variable, so in this case the skid length. So to calculate residuals, if we think about the geometry of it, I'm going to go to my OneNote file here. Let's just draw a little picture of some data set. In this case, our data looks something like this. And if I think about laying a line on top of this, it might look something like this. It would be nice to have a couple more data points. Yeah, that's true. Because of this idea of how far out do you want to think about the line, and if you had more data points, there would be a big difference in, in between. Now, the line would be different too, right? Maybe maybe if I had a couple more data points down here, the line would come down a little bit, but in, e in any case, we can still see whether or not we want to make predictions using that line because we'll keep drawing the line further out. So if I, if I change the line slightly to accommodate kind of those new points, if I use a linear regression line, maybe I'll be pulled down towards these lines, these points. But you can see that as I keep doing this, right, I'm going to be missing, in a sense, some of these middle points here. Let me just kind of draw this a little bit darker. And that this is the, the idea of the residual is going to help me get um, some, again, a story or a particular handle on some of these. So Sonia's coming back. She hopes you're not going over 80. Right, yes. good point. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too, good point. But I think people do drive over 80 miles an hour. Okay, so let's think about a residual. So a residual is going to measure error. So if I think about the actual Y value for this particular data point, let's call that Y sub A. That's my actual Y value. And I can't tell which, which is which in terms of my line. Let me see if I can erase one of these lines. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so suppose I went with this first line where I didn't really have those other data points. I'll get rid of those too. Then if I have my actual Y value of my data point, that's set right there on the Y axis. And if I think of my predicted value, let me change my colors here. If I think about the predicted value, well, if I take this X value and I substitute it into my model, then this will be my predicted Y value. I call it Y sub P. So the actual is y sub a, I subtract from it y sub p, and that will be my residual for that point. So that you will have as many residuals as you have data points. So in this particular case, there's, this is one residual. It's a residual associated with that data point. 
So if you're working on your calculator and you've done a linear regression, suppose you've typed your linear regression into Y1. I'm going to go back to Excel just real quick. So I have about 0.255x plus 17.95. 0.255x plus 17.95. If you type that in there or just use the save command and you actually have more precision in your calculator, if I think about the actual y values, if I've typed my data in L1 and L2, okay, these are the skid lengths and these are the speeds. So if I think about calculating one of these, I would take a particular speed, let's say I want the, the residual associated with that first data point. So the speed was 10 miles per hour, and I'm going to take my model evaluated at 10 miles per hour. So this is actual minus predicted. Sorry. A little bit messy because I'm right when my screen up sticking straight up in the air. Okay, so if we go to um, our calculators, we can calculate all of those at one time. But if this is new to students, I'd like to do one and just one on the home screen. So on the home screen, we could actually type the number 10 minus y1 of 10, or maybe you'd want to do y1 of 10 and see what the model predicts, and then subtract subtract that value from 10. So you can do one of those on your home screen. And then you can actually calculate them all at once in your calculator, and we can store them in L3. So I would do that with my students, do one, and then do the whole list. But since you guys are advanced learners, we'll do it all together. So Sonia has a question. Oh, yes, exactly. Thank you. Sonia says we should be using 5 for the skid mark. Exactly. Sorry. I had my cord on top of this. Yep. So the skid mark, skid length is 5 feet. You're going 10 miles per hour. Good catch. Thanks, Sonia. Okay. So if I'm going to calculate them all at once in L3 on my calculator, then I can do all of the Y values, which are in L2. And if I've stored my model in Y1, then I can say minus Y1 of L1. Now, if you're using the calculator and you're not using to act, used to grabbing this Y1, this lives in a special place on your calculator. You'll go to the VARS key, and this is described in the calculator step. So I go to VARS, I have to do it on my calculator to remember how to do it. Um, the VARS key is right next to the left of the clear key, and then arrow over to Y VARS. And then once you uh, arrow over to Y VARS, you can choose function. And then you can choose wherever function, whatever function you've stored um, your model in. Okay, so I'm going to do it on Excel, and y'all can see if you get the same things I do. I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to type. These are my residuals. Now, remember, your residuals depend on the particular model. So in this case, these are residuals for the linear model. Maybe I don't have to put all this. It's just a linear or line. Okay, and I'll stretch that a little bit. So if you think about it from an Excel standpoint, you're taking all of the Y values. So let's just take the speed. And the way I can do that is I can type an equal sign, click on the speed here, and subtract from that. Notice it, it replaces it with a cell number, B2. And I can say minus, oh, um, what I think I'll do is just type in this, this uh, linear model. So I'm going to say minus the quantity, 0. 0.2549 times the x value, which is the 5 that um, Sonia just grabbed for me. She said, pay attention to that. That needs to be a 5. But I'm going to click on that cell over there. And then I'm going to type in the y-intercept, 17.953. So I'm just using the precision that showed up on my screen when I did the um, linear regression. And I hit Enter. And again, you guys were doing this on your calculator. And then on the on Excel, I can either when I see this um, full color crosshair, I can just I think I can just double click right there in the corner and it'll fill down, or I can drag it down and say fill down too. So if you look at these, these are my residuals associated with each one of these data points. 
And for example, the first one is negative 9.2275. And it should make sense that it's negative. And you can ask students this, what does the negative mean in terms of the residual? Because your y value is, your actual y value is smaller than the y value predicted by the model. So if we're going to do actual minus predicted, it would be negative. And in particular, it means that, in terms of the geometry, that your point lies below your model. So one of the things I like to do is to actually graph this residual, this residual plot. I can look at a graph of all of these. I can look down these values, but I can also look at a graph of these. And I'm going to um, do that. On your calculator, if you store those in L3, you just need to turn a new stat plot on and, and um, choose L1 as your independent variable and L3 as your dependent variable and the X and the Y list. And then do a zoom 9, which will choose an appropriate window for you. you if you have your model in Y1, for example, you might want to go turn that off so that it doesn't try to graph that along on your screen. So I'm just going to highlight um, the first column and then I let go of my mouse and my click and I'm just going to come over here to the top of C and I'm going to hit control click and that way it just highlights those two columns and then I can do an insert <coughs> scatter. And there's my scatter plot <coughs> excuse me, of my residuals. So if you look at that we would say that there's a definite pattern in the residuals and what I mean by that is this the idea of pattern can sometimes be subjective and very confusing to students. It's not always clear, but in this case it's clear, I think, because if you think about looking at the, this uh, residual plot, you can almost fit like a, a really nice curve through those residuals, right? Which means that there's a definite pattern. Another way to think about it is I've had colleagues say, you know, if I look at um, kind of being on one of these dots and I'm walking along the dots, and then let's say I'm here, or even here, and I cover up the other dot, could you predict where the next one would be? And like I said, there's this nice smooth curve. What you want is them, you want them scattered about the x-axis, because that's what we call no pattern in the residual, or that the, the residuals are random, so that you have some good, some uh, uh, an idea of um, the model being a good representative of your data. You can see that if I did have more of these data points that I would be going down here. Yeah, the pattern shows up in the table as well. Exactly. We have this negative, then these positives, and then these negatives. It's exactly true, Lisa. And in particular, it's not just negative, positive, negative, but they're, they're actually, these are, I guess, are increasing to the positives, then we're increasing, then decreasing to the negatives, and then increasing again at magnitude, I guess. Okay? So we, this idea of a pattern in the residuals tells a story. It says you've got the wrong model. The wrong model could be, it could be that you have the wrong type of function, but it also could mean that um, there's some other things about the characteristics of the data that don't match the function. So let's go back to our PowerPoint and think about I want. Think about um, trying to find a better model. So if you think about what tools do students have to find models for nonlinear data sets? They know about linear regression. They know about lines. They know how to come up with their own linear model even for a data set. Do you guys have suggestions about what kinds of things students might have at their disposal in terms of tools for trying to come up with a nonlinear model? Can be, it can be broad, like big ideas, or it can be something specific. Ideas for what students have at their disposal in terms of coming up with nonlinear models. Okay, so Sonia has said that uh, nonlinear will be their last unit, so you'll, they'll think about exponential and quadratic functions because those are the particular types of functions that they'll study. And so Sonia, if I go um, back to your idea and I, I say, okay, 
maybe a student has a quadratic quadratics and exponentials and some experience for those functions, would they want to use one of those models here? Well, there you go, Sonia. She said, but isn't this a square root? Right. So as the students get gain more experience with various types of functions, then they'll have more at their disposal. They'll be able to say, oh, this looks like, and maybe it's a particular parent function, like the square root or x squared or 2 to the x, if those are their types of functions that they have in their toolboxes, right? And uh, Don said power, power models. So I have to get everybody right. rem remind everybody to um, send your messages to everyone. So yeah. So if you think about a power model, again, power function is a broader category of the, the quadratics and the square roots, right? A square root function is x raised to the one half power. So that is a power function because it's x raised to some power. So the variable is in the, the base in a sense. And um, so the other thing is in terms of power functions, they could also be reciprocal functions, like a 1 over x is a power function. So as kids have more experience with those different kinds of models, they might say, oh, yeah, this looks like, and then choose one of those models. It's a problem that can be revisited over and over as students learn more functions in Math 2 and Math 3. Exactly, Sonia. In fact, what I'm trying to do today is lay the groundwork for these, um, for those other courses, because um, you can think about as their experience grows, they can come back and they say, oh, now I, I have a kind of a bigger library of functions to choose from. Another thing that I think is very powerful about studying nonlinear data is the idea of using inverses to straighten the data. So that's what I'd like to talk about now. And even though, Yes, that's true. So but Lisa, Lisa's saying, is this an algebra 2 or above? Because math 1 students don't, they, that's exactly true. They don't have the experience with um, power functions or exponentials or quadratics. But I will say this, Lisa, even though they don't have that experience, the, um, if you look at the Common Core Standards, it does say that students are supposed to be able to differentiate about these different kinds of functions. So even though they might not have spent a lot of time studying exponentials or quadratics, one of the things that I think data can provide for even Math 1 students is a place where you can start introducing those ideas of these other types of functions and then think about helping students discern between those models. So certainly we can discern between linear and nonlinear. And then um, Dawn says natural log will be covered in my class first, so natural log um, the X and the Y to see if it fits a linear pattern. Okay, so Don, hold on to that. It's a great idea. We're going to go there after I talk about re-expressing in a different way. So she's talking about what's known as re-expressing the data. That has been a topic that traditionally has been um, taught in statistics courses. But I'd like to just talk a little bit about it here because it uses some more traditional topics, kind of the traditional topics in algebra 1 and 2 and even higher of using this idea of straightening the data and that we can, if we think the data is of a particular type, if we think a square root function is appropriate, instead of taking just the square root and kind of using transformations of functions, which you could certainly do, another great application here, you could think about how does one undo what the square root function does? Because as you learn more about functions, or even use this as an introductory um, lesson for, for motivating the topic of inverses. So when, when I start inverses, I start really simply. I think about a linear function. I say, okay, I get, um, you give me a number, I double it, and I subtract 3. And then I talk to kids about writing that as a function, right? So I double it and subtract 3, so I got 2x minus 3. But then I might say, well, how do I undo that process? So students have to think about if I give if they give me a number and I double it and subtract three, how do I undo that to get the number that they originally gave me? So that notion of inverses can be started at a pretty um, elementary level, but then later on, if you say, well, okay, you give me a number, I square it. How do I undo that squaring? Students will say, take the square root. Or you give me a number and I take the square root. How do I undo that process? I'd square it. So this idea of inverses can be introduced at different levels and then expanded upon later on, as you said, Sonia, you can keep revisiting this. Maybe you could say, 
uh, you know, even later on throughout the year, you could say, well, let's revisit this data problem. But I didn't have as many tools in my tool bag. Now I have more. Let's think about how that broadens our um, library of, of solution methods in a sense. Okay, so Don, your, your idea is a great one. Um, I want you to hold on to it because that's really leading uh, further down the road to the more sophisticated notion of what you're really talking about is log log expression. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and just talk a little bit about um, straightening the data. Thank you all very much for participating. Y'all are doing a great job. So this is the idea. How can we use inverses to re-express or linearize the data? So if you think the model is uh, quadratic, how can you linearize the data? We answered that question. You could take the square root of the y value, right? If you think it's cubic, you could take the cube root. If you think that a square root function, which is what Tanya suggested this one was, how can we linearize the data? So it's pretty obvious that you would square the y value. So I'd like to experiment that with y'all, with that on your calculators now. If you've typed the data in L1 and L2, I, I really don't need those residuals for the linear model anymore, so if you want to, you can clear out your L3. And in L3 now, what I'd like to do is take the square, take the square of the Y values, that is, square all the car speeds. So I'm going to do that on Excel, and y'all can play along on your calculators. Don't really need this one. We'll leave it down here because we've decided that certainly in Math 1, kids should be able to know that a, a linear, when a linear model is not appropriate, basically that these residuals are patterned. That is, that's in the common core state standards um, for math one. So let's go over here, and what we're going to do is, I'm going to keep up with what we're doing, and I always suggest my, to my students that they write this in their notes. Keep up with what's in L1 and L2 and L3. I'm going to square the um, speed, but this is just a column heading for me. If I'm going to square the speeds in Excel, I'll just go equal and then go get the cell and square it. For you guys using your calculators, just go to the top of L3, for example, and all you got to do is type L2 squared. I'm going to say equal speed squared. Hit enter. If I go back and click on this cell, and again, you got to move your cursor until it changes to the right crosshair. There's this fat, fat kind of X. Then there's this X, and then finally there's the one I want, and I can double click, and that fills the cell. Okay? So if I thought the original data set was square root, which it certainly looks like it is square root, I'm going to square all the Y values, and now what I'd like to do is create a scatter plot of the skid marks along the horizontal axis and the square speed along the vertical axis. So if you're playing along with your calculator, if you just did that in L3, your scatter plot is probably still on from your residuals. Do scatter plot with L1 in the X list, um, L3 in the Y list if these are in L3, and then do a zoom 9 so that it chooses an appropriate window. Along here, I'm just going to highlight this. So I'll click on this column and let go. Then I'm going to hit the control button and click on this column, and I'm going to say insert scatter. Choose scatter. Oh, wow. That is beautiful. So if you look at that, you'll say that looks linear, right? It looks like a great linear data set. And then we know we have a way to find a linear model. We could choose two points, find the slope and the intercept. Oh, look at that, Tanya says she's got an R of 0.99999. So she did a linear regression on that. Is that what you did, Sonia? She did a linear regression. Yep on your calculator and she gets a beautiful R because if the data is linear, then R gives you some indication of the spread of the data around the linear regression line. In this case, not a lot of spread because the data is so beautiful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on it, add a trend line, um, show the equation on my screen. Oh, okay. I have a message from Lisa. Mm -hmm. As a AP statistics teacher, uh, taught the process the AP students, just trying to see how far we could take students in terms of where they are in Common Core. So we could just teach Algebra 1, Math 1 students, that residuals can help us determine the appropriateness of a linear model. Where beyond that do we take Algebra 2 students? 
Okay, besides just looking at the, um, you're saying if there's a pattern in the residuals, then we know a linear model is not appropriate. Is that what you're saying, Lisa? Yes, okay. So um, beyond linear models for Algebra 2, we do this in our pre-calculus classes too. As, as you try to um, come up with models for various data sets, again, as your repertoire in a sense expands as a student in terms of different types of functions, you, can, you keep going back to this idea of residuals telling you in general if you've got the right type of function. So if I had said, well, uh, for example, if we have an increasing function that's concave up, well, an increasing function that's concave up could be a lot of different functions, right? It could be a power function, like x squared or x cubed. It could be an exponential function, right? So there are things like that where you might say, well, let me see if I can, you can even use this method, where I'm going to try to guess at the appropriate power and try to undo it using inverses of functions. So this is a great application of inverses of functions, again, for higher level students. Yeah, so you could keep revisiting it. And now, if you're an AP stats teacher, you, of course, know about log-log re-expression. And so if we're guessing that is it quadratic or is it cubic, and in fact, it's the power function that's in between 2 and 3, we know that this log-log re-expression can be used um, to come up with a particular power. So those of you who teach Math 1, don't worry about this in terms of this log-log re-expression. That is a, a more advanced topic, but I do that in my um, uh, pre-calculus classes for my students because they do it a lot in science, to be honest with you. If the kids don't take AP stats, they haven't taken that yet, but they're in a biology course or a chemistry course, oftentimes scientists will use semi-log and log-log re-expression. And if students haven't had an AP statistics course, it, it kind of leaves them wondering why the heck does this work, when in fact your pre-calculus knowledge or even Algebra 2 knowledge, as long as you know enough about exponentials and logarithms to know that they're inverses of each other, it can be very powerful and a great application for what is a, a more traditional topic. It's a great way to, data is a great way to introduce some of these, um, what we consider traditional topics like understanding inverse of functions. So now, if I say to Sonia, yeah, you have an R value that is one and you understand what R means, we can stop there, but I can also say how else could we figure out if we have been successful in linearizing the data? This was a, a pretty nice data set, I'll have to admit, but there are times when you're not quite sure you've linearized the data, like I even said, wow, that looks linear, and, I, and my students will say, that looks good, and I'll say, stop, wait, we're mathematicians. We need to be able to say what it means from a mathematical standpoint. Um, in terms of looking good. So you might even use this point in the process to say, let's look at the residual plot for the quote unquote linearized data. So let me go back to the PowerPoint to see where we are there, because I tend to kind of um, skip ahead. Yeah, there we go. So we're, we're using this calculator to re-express the data. We've, we've tried uh, some particular process to straighten the data. We found the linear model for the re-expressed data and then assess the process to see if we have been successful. So Sonia has said, look at your R value. I might even say, let's find the residuals for the quote unquote linearized data and see if we really have been successful. So um, if we do that, does anybody want me to go ahead and do that? Do you want to find the residuals for the linearized data? We can do that easily in the calculator and I can do it on Excel. I'll let you guys let me know. Again, this is a very special data set. It looks really beautiful. I got it from the Common Core Math Tools from NCTM, but I've seen it in other places too. So, okay. Okay, let's do this. So, let's go back. I'm going to do it in Excel again. Um, if you need help with the calculator, holler. I'm going to say, well, let me see if I really have been successful in linearizing this data. So, I'm going to go over here, and in this cell, I'm going to put the residuals for the re-expressed data. I won't call it linearized because maybe we didn't really linearize it. So these are residuals for re-expressed data. So if you think about it, what I've got here is this beautiful linear data set, I think it's linear, and this linear model. Well, just like we could calculate residuals for any model in any data set, I can do that here. What I want to do is say the actual y values which if you put the 
squared speeds in your L3 would live in L3. You could say L3 minus, and now if you've stored the linear model as 24.076x minus 5.03322 and say Y2, then you could say L3 minus Y2 of L1. So Sonia says it'll be a shift for our teachers and students to put less stock in R and look at the residuals. I think they're used to using R to judge the model because before Common Core they did not make residual plots. As a, for, as a former AP stats teacher, I prefer the way that you're developing. Well, thank you, Sonia. I think this is powerful because that you just saw that that R value was really great for this model. I left this picture on the screen because this hits you over the head. A, a linear model is not what I want to use here. I don't want to make predictions with this linear model. It's, you, you can almost see the obvious pattern in the residual here when you think about these guys being negative, these guys being positive, et cetera. So that R value, I can give you some other examples of some data sets where your R is going to be good, but there is an obvious pattern in the residuals, or there's even an obvious pattern in the Y values. You can see that it's cubic data, and here you are using a linear model. It doesn't make sense. So I think it's a great way, again, to use some of these very powerful, important topics in mathematics to help students make sense of what they're doing instead of just hitting magic buttons. Okay. So let's go back to the residuals for the re-expressed datum. I'm going to take the squared values here. Those are my actual, because I squared them, right? So I'm going to say equals um, this guy. Sorry, let me go to the cell. Equals this cell. Minus the predicted value. The predicted value is 24.076 times my skid mark minus 5.0322. Okay, so that's actual minus predicted, but I'm using actual of the re-expressed data. There is a residual. If I wait till I have the right crosshair and hit double click, maybe not. I might have to fill this one down. There we go. Okay, so if I want to make a scatter plot of these residuals, they seem awfully big, don't they? Oh, I see why. They seem really big to me because they were in the 15, 22, but look at the y values here. I, I squared all of the speeds. So the magnitude of the speed squared is huge. So these residuals, I was thinking, oh, they aren't, they're, they're very big, but relative to the y values, they're not that big. So let's do a scatter plot of the new residuals for the quote unquote linearized data. I'm going to click on this column. You guys could just turn a scatter plot on for, say, L1 and L4, if that's where you so stored them. I'm going to hit control click here. I'm going to insert a scatter plot. And look at that residual plot. That's that's enough to make your day. <laughs> so look at it. It's a scattered residual. They're scattered across the x axis, not a definite pattern in the residuals. Some of you, again, might be concerned, like I was, that they were large, but relative to the y values, they're not. And if you want to calculate the percent error, you could just take these and divide them by their respective squared y values, multiply it by 100. So this is great. So Lisa says this really connects traditional topics to the data and, and um, stats world. Yeah, and that, again, I think it's the data and stats world that the statistics is coming into the regular, kind of the regular courses of mathematics. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's really helping students become more just educated in terms of mathematical concepts that can help them in the real world. So these, these topics are a wonderful way to show students the relevance of some of these traditional topics. Okay, So I think we're kind of running down in time here, but um, so what I want to do is just now that we've kind of used this process and said, wow, we've done a great job, we really did guess right in terms of thinking that it was a square root function, let's go out of this process, back out of it, to, re to revisit the original data set. So we'll go back to the PowerPoint and we'll think about the mathematics and how the mathematics that we've done has brought us to this spot. So Sonia says she wants more data sets. I can share that with you. I have a great resource for you, um, Sonia. The NCTM core um, tool, it's a, it's a new tool they've just developed, has a ton of data sets and I'll share that with you. Um, at the end. I've got that on my last slide 
as a resource, and I'll show you how to grab some of that data. In fact, that's where this data came from. I've seen it other places, too. So. so let's think about the mathematics. We squared the y values, and then we came up with a linear function. We used our calculators or our computers to do that. You don't have to. If you don't want to hit the linear regression button, that data was beautifully linear, so you could have just let the kids practice coming up with their own lines. And then when we go back to think about, well, how am I going to go back to the original data set? If you think about S being the speed of the car, depending on the length of the skid, again, I'm trying to figure out what the speed is based on a, a length, a skid length that I've measured. Then if you want to solve for the, in, the dependent variable now, all you got to do is do the algebra, right? Just take the square root of both sides, and you get S equals the square root of, in my particular case, ML plus B. So for our case, we have the M and the B. Our computers or calculators gave us those numbers. And um, when you're solving this equation, this totally depended on what we did with the re-expression. So if you can see here, if instead of squaring the Y values, I had taken the square root of the Y values, that's what would be here. So I'd have the square root of the S is equals ML plus B then you solve for S. Or maybe I took the cube root. So this process depends on the re-expression that I did, and then the algebra to solve this equation depends on what the students know in terms of solving equations. So if I want to come up with my final model, that is the model for the nonlinear data set, all I got to do is write the square root of ML plus B, where M is the slope given by my computer calculator, and B is the intercept. Um, if I think about looking at that model, let's do that. Let's graph the nonlinear model with the nonlinear data, and then we can go back to the idea of residuals here. We can use residuals um, to think about, did I get the right model? Because of all the work I've already done, I have a pretty good indication that my residual plot is going to look pretty good because I really did linearize the data. And then um, we can use our nonlinear model to make some predictions. So let's, I'm going to go to Excel and do that, and y'all can play along with the calculator. I'm going to move all this stuff out of the way. Don't need this one. I think I'm going to delete that one. Too. Okay. So this was all a process. Something that you might want to be careful of if you're going to use this in your classes is that you might want to make sure that the kids have their work organized pretty well in their papers because what happens sometimes is they do a bunch of stuff on their calculator and they get stuck and you don't really know exactly what they did and they don't remember exactly what they did. So it gets a little bit hard to troubleshoot if they don't keep an account of what they've done. So I have my kids write L1, L2, L3, L4, L5 on their papers and write down what each of those um, holds in terms of this process. So let's go to our um, final model. I'm going to put prediction, predicted values from the final model in here. I actually need this model here so I get that data set back. So this is going to be my nonlinear y value. So if you think about this in terms of the mathematics, you could put this, say, in L5 now. <clears throat> This is going to be my model, my nonlinear model, evaluated at all my axes. So my nonlinear model, we've established the fact, is the square root of all these. Should they only look at the residual plot for the linearized data, or is it legitimate to look at a residual plot? Yeah, I like to, I like to look at a residual plot for the final model as well. Now, they should match, like I said, because of the process that we used. But the reason I um, want to look at the nonlinear residuals is because the nonlinear residuals will help me calculate percent error in my final model. So I'll take those residuals and divide them by the y values of the original data set to say, yeah, not only do I, I don't have a pattern, so that's good news, but I can tell you specifically that my residuals are quote unquote small, small by what measure, small by um, percent error measure. So that's a great question, Sonia, thank you. So I'm going to just take my model, which is going to be the square root, that's QRT, of 24.076, this is my linear model, but I'm taking the square root of it, times my skid marks minus 
3322. Close the parent. And that should be my new model evaluated at five feet. So it makes sense. That's so about 10.7, right? Look at the data set. The speed right there is 10. If anybody needs help with that, let me know. On your calculator, it would be easier. Just type this linear model, or if you've stored it, say, in Y4. If you've got your linear model there in Y4, say, in Y5, just type the square root of 24.076x minus 5.0322. And then you could just do L2 minus, say, Y4 of L1. I apologize for not having the emulator working. I'm going to go here and double click. Um, and again, those seem reasonable. Look at these Y values compared to the data set. Look at that last one. They're all great, right? Look at that 79.844, and that Y value is 80. So if you want to go back to this graph, I think I can get rid of this trend line now. And I can put these guys on that data set. Maybe I'll just do a whole new graph. So I'm going to graph these and control click and go over here to the last one, control click. That's just to highlight all of them. And then I'm going to insert a graph. Look at that. You can't even see them because they're on top of each other. So <laughs> I'm going to right click on, can I right click on this? I think I just need to make them smaller. So Sonia likes you doing it Excel. Yeah, because you can tr keep track of what you calculated. Yeah, and then you can always go to a cell if you're, you've forgotten what you've done. And you can see lots of different graphs, yeah. It is nice. I mean, the calculator is limited in terms of the representations. You can see all of your graphs at the same time. So yeah, I mean, I might use this more often. I do use Excel in my classrooms, uh, in my classroom, a lot of times just to demonstrate. but. Um, also, I think it's a nice tool to be able to help students use if you get literate with Excel or other spreadsheets. And I imagine some of you might use Inspires, and I think the Inspire, I'm not a, a, um, an Inspire person, but if you use Inspires, the Inspire has uh, ways to do this too. So um, I think we can change the style and then, okay, and then see that they're right on top of each other, okay? So you might change that so that it's a line instead of these dots on top of each other. Pretty great fit. We can calcu calculate residuals. The, again, there shouldn't be a pattern in the residuals. The pattern should match that, re that residuals for the re-expressed data. And then you can find the percent error by taking the Y values of the data set divided by, I mean, I'm sorry, the residuals divided by the Y value of the data set times 100. So I'm going to keep going because we're almost out of time and go back to the PowerPoint to just share some of those resources with you. So um, you can make predictions. I said predict a skid length for a car traveling at a speed of 90 miles per hour. Um, that's actually backwards, right? Because in that case, what I'd have to do is say, what if my um, speed is 90 miles per hour, what would I expect, expect my sp uh, skid length to be? Or you could say, suppose I'm a, um, a police person and I'm out there and I've measured a skid mark of, say, 70 feet, what, what would the um, predicted speed of that car be? So lots of nice predictions you can make. You can also make a sense maybe out of the constants in your model, too. But I'm going to keep moving so we can get to the resources. So in terms of the content standards, this hits a lot of content standards, in particular for statistics. Um, if you'll notice, again, in Math 1, it says differentiating between linear and quadratic and exponential functions. Now, this is a square root function. But if we'd gone back to the problem and said, let's swap the x's and the y's, suppose I, suppose I want to think about um, if I have the car speed, what would I expect the skid length to be? Then you would have a quadratic data set. And you can do the same process, but in reverse in a sense, OK? Um, functions, a lot of stuff with functions, understanding concepts with functions. And then I just put inverse functions at the bottom because it's a beautiful application of inverses of functions, and it's in the Common Core as well. Not until later on, though, not in Math 1. Um, and then, of course, the practices. If we had more time, we'd talk a little bit about these. This will be archived, so if people are watching this later or if folks are watching this in their PLC, then maybe you can take this particular task and think about these particular practices. But in, in, in general, it's a great way to get students talking about the mathematics. 
This is the uh, NCTM core math tools website that I just grabbed some of these. This is the car skid length. Um, you can put a linear regression line on it. You can um, graph the residuals. And this is a great tool to be able to um, grab some of these pretty graphs. And you could put this on an assessment. You could give kids that middle graph there and say, sketch a little picture of what you think the residual plot's going to look like. And it's not that you want that precise picture on the right, but it could be just the notion of do they understand what a residual represents. Um, Lisa says she has an Inspire, but it's not as easy to navigate as Excel. That, that's been my experience when I've tried to use the Inspire, but um, I have not spent a lot of time doing it. So some people are really, um, they love their Inspires, and I think this is accessible to those folks, but I just have not been very successful in that. Um, in terms of resources, we've got those NCTM core math tools. Go check them out. They're really cool. I might pull them up real quick at the end here. NCSSM has developed uh, materials for AFM and Algebra 2, and it's got a lot of data there, quadratic and exponential in particular. And then uh, this was just a little plug for our conference. We're having a conference here at the end of next week on Friday and Saturday. And even though it's right up against the deadline, we might um, still have some room for you. We'd love to see you if you're interested. You can um, go to that website. Or you can also go to the second website. You can just do a Google search on TCM, NCSSM, and you can see that I gave a talk here last year about um, nonlinear data and common core, and I used a data set that had to do with water flowing out of a jug. I made a video of water flowing out of a jug, and then I graphed the height over time. Great nonlinear data set. Niels Abel is an awesome um, colleague who works in Massachusetts. He uh, teaches at Deerfield Academy and has created his own um, course materials for a course called Alternative to Precalculus or Function Statistics and Trig. All of this stuff is free and available on his Moodle site. He loves for you to use it and has some great, great probability and data, um, actually mostly data analysis on his website now. Um, the water jug problem is up on the website for the TCM. And um, so I won't have a chance to talk about that. Our next session will be in February. We haven't decided on the date yet because we haven't decided on whether or not um, we'll have kind of a separate webinar where uh, it will be just me talking about the PowerPoint or if it'll be some local people here because it'll be um, for Durham County teachers that are going to come here to NCSSM. And uh, Sonia, yes, uh, we will be sending out the PowerPoint. After the session is over, it'll be archived. And uh, we will send you um, a link to the archives and also ask you to do a survey, um, complete a survey on this session. All right. So um, thank you all very much for being here. As usual, comments and suggestions are welcome. Um, we're, we're trying to tweak it as we go. I think we're getting better and better <laughs> as we go along. And this will be archived for everybody. And if, if you have any questions or any comments, you, you get to something and one of those links isn't working, just shoot me an email and we'll get it, we'll get it fixed um, hopefully very quickly. And check out those Common Core Math Tools at NCTM. Thank you all very much. Y'all have been wonderful. It's been so nice to have some back and forth, and I think this has been the most vocal group.